Good morning. It's about time for us to begin the Bible class this morning. We have a larger class this morning. We've brought most of the other classes in this morning from fifth and sixth grade, I believe, up in here this morning. Uh, just as uh, before we begin with our class this morning, we want to uh, introduce the speaker. This is the beginning of our gospel meeting uh, with Michael Light. And if you have read your bulletin, which I hope you have, you'll see that the topic is the heart of God. He's going to be discussing this hour this morning, David's heart. And so uh, most of you, or many of you I know, have seen or at least heard Michael before. He's been here on our lectureship, I think, a few times. It's been a little while, but we're glad to have him with us this morning. And as we begin with our Bible class this morning... Before we turn it over to him, we want to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer, and then Michael will give us the class period time this morning. Would you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for the opportunity to assemble here this morning and to study your word. We pray that we might remove all the cares and the thoughts of this world from our minds, that we might focus upon those things that are being said, that we might search them out, that we might diligently strive to live by your word that we might take the things that we hear and as we study them, that we might appropriately apply them to our lives, that we might be stronger and more faithful in your service, that we might be more bold in the proclamation of it, and that we might always be ready to give an answer to those that ask us the hope that lies within us. Pray that you'd be with Michael this morning as he brings to us those things that he's prepared, and we pray that you'd bless him in his service as he works here this week and as he labors in your kingdom each and every day that you'd bless him with health, that you'd bless him with uh, the ability and the desire to study your word and to proclaim it wherever he may be also. Forgive us of our sins as we repent of them, and we pray that you would help us always to cultivate a heart that would be acceptable to those things that we find that are missing our lives, that we would repent of them and change them as we live day to day. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Michael. Well, it is good to be with you today. Uh, it rained every mile I traveled yesterday getting down here, I guess. It was a little bit dry in San Antonio, but uh, man, the Lord did smile on us this week. The whole state more or less got good soaking rain, and it's always nice to get the fall crops in, especially to get a little bit of rain on them, get everything going the right way. We're going to spend our time this week, as he mentioned, discussing the heart of God. And what I mean by that basically is the kind of heart that God expects us as people to have. Now, we're going to look at David. He mentioned David's heart. That's in the worship hour. Right now, we're going to look at Daniel's heart, though. And we're going to see in these individuals what we're supposed to be. Sometimes folks just look at you like a monkey doing a math problem when it comes to trying to figure out what are we supposed to do. Just kind of, duh, I don't know. Why are you here? I don't know. I almost brought a lesson with me to preach on uh, worship and just really dissect every act of worship, what we're supposed to be doing, what we're supposed to be thinking, where we're supposed to be emotionally and spiritually and physically in each and every act of worship. We should just be sitting there just kind of like, I wish they'd hurry up, pot roast is ready. I mean, we have to have our mind focused. What do we focus on every day? What kind of person are you? Here's a, a thought. Where will you be when you get where you're going? Now think about that. If you keep on being the kind of husband you are right now, how's your marriage and home going to be in the end? If you keep on being the exact kind of Bible student you are right now, how much Bible are you going to know 20, 30, 40 years from now? You keep on being the exact same kind of mother, exact same kind of wife, the exact same kind of kid. You're on a certain path. You know what kind of path it is, good or bad. If you keep doing what you're doing, how's it going to turn out? One of the greatest travesties of all time is the unexamined life, and far too many live those kind of lives. Slap the alarm clock, get up, run to work, you know, drop the kids off, run to work, run back, pick them up, throw a fish stick in their mouth, throw them in bed, pass out trying to watch the news, and get up and do it again. Wake up old and don't have a clue where life went or what it was about. So we're going to be examining different people and different topics that I hope will help us refocus our lives our thoughts our hearts our minds 
What are we doing? Why are we doing it? What is the purpose? Where are we going? How are we supposed to live? I'm glad you asked that question. That's the topic of our discussion this morning. When we think of Romans 15 verse 4, what's the things written for time, written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Do you want hope? You ever get depressed? You ever get down? You ever get confused? You ever get afraid? You ever feel uncertain? Y'all live down here by the ocean. You ever feel like a boat that's just being sucked out to sea and you can't control what's going on around you? You ever feel that? You know why you feel that? Because there's a lack of grounding in the truth. There's a lack of understanding about what it's all about. 100 years from now, it won't matter to us one way or the other who wins this election next month. I'm not saying it doesn't matter to us now. But in priority, who is the president in 1923? Who is the vice president in 1937? They were big dogs and very important back then, weren't they? I bet not one in this crowd can pull them out of the air without Googling that thing on your phone, right? The point is a matter of priority. So I want to look back at Daniel and his friends and see what kind of man does God want me to be? One of the greatest teaching books of the whole Bible. Daniel chapter 1. These are young men. And during the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar comes, reigning in the stead of his father Nabonidus, and he conquers the land. And they enslave what we'd call the, the upper crust kids, the good kids. A lot of them were, were the children of the royal household. There's a reason behind it. I've got four kids. Let's say that some invading army captures Bangs one of these days. Right here at Portland, you know, with the Corpus Christi, the Bay Area gets captured by an invading army. You know how one of the best ways to control people? Take one of my kids back as hostage. I'm going to be a lot more docile as a subject, aren't I? If I know rebellion would lead to the death of my child. So they took these kids with them, but they took the smart ones and the ones that had some connection, they took them back to Shinar, the chief city of Babylon. And for three years, they're going to educate them, going to retrain them in the language, going to retrain them in the culture, going to prepare them to be servants of Nebuchadnezzar. That was very much, by the way, the practice for years. An invading army would go through, and you would, you would, if you found someone, whether it be a really gifted blacksmith, a really gifted metal worker, a really gifted scientist, whatever it was, where did we get all that technology on those rockets that we developed in the 50s and 60s? Primarily from defectors from Germany and Russia in the 40s and 50s, right? Isn't that how it happened? Same thing here. So you take gifted people, you bring them back, you retool them in your culture, and you use their intelligence. You use their gifts to advance your culture. Now, when, the, when you bring those slaves home, they're about 400 miles from where they started. So the, the, their city has been brutalized. Perhaps their family's even killed in this conquest. And these young men, I don't think they're little bitty boys, but they're not men yet. They're teenage boys, it appears to me, as far as the way the passage is written. These young guys, taken slave, and they walked 400 miles to Shinar. By the way, we find them in the house of the eunuchs. You know what a eunuch is? Another terrible experience for young men to go through. So there they are. Their world's been turned upside down. They've been, been taken away from their town, been brutalized, been captured, been thrown in this foreign country. You ever been to a foreign country? I went to Oklahoma one time, scared me to death. <laughs> That's you, Brother Morgan. <laughs> but you know, you go somewhere, if you ever been somewhere where they don't speak your language, I have been to New York. That's pretty scary too. But I've also done some foreign travel. When you, when you go, it is somewhat intimidating, isn't it? Well, I've got a passport and I've got a return ticket. I can get out of there if I need to. Well, they couldn't get out of there. So I'm, I'm trying to set the stage here. Their entire world has been turned upside down. And, and they're brought into this, this house and food is put before them. And it's not bologna and beans. It's good stuff. They're feeding them the very same food. It says they were fed off of the king's table. But there was something in that food that was prohibited. And we could debate back and forth. Well, it must have been pork. It must have been catfish. It must have been some other kind of unclean food. The wine was also, something was wrong with it. I don't particularly care what the specific was. It doesn't matter. Whether it was a forbidden food, whether it was food that had been offered to idols, which was also forbidden for a Jew to eat, something about the food was wrong. Now, I want you to get real honest with yourself right now. You've undergone all those things they went through. Your world's been turned upside down. God's promises at this moment are very, very distant. 
in the reality of your life. They brought that food in there and everybody bellied up and ate. Except for three men. Well, four. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know how we are. You ever argue with yourself? I've done that so much. You know, there's something coming along, you know you really shouldn't do it, or you know you should do it, whatever the case is. You have an obligation approaching, and you don't want to deal with it. You ever had that argument? Well, yeah, I don't, you know, you give yourself all these reasons why you shouldn't have to do what you know you should, or why you should be able to do what you know you shouldn't. So if, if you're in that room, what would you have done? Well, I wouldn't have eaten that food, really. After all they'd been through, the destruction of their city, the murder of their family and friends, at least some of them, the ruination of their physical body, the, 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 the theft of their entire life's future. These men are going to die in this country as old men, slaves. It's never getting better. But the key to this entire book is found in Daniel 1 and verse 8. We're told there that Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself before the Lord. That's the difference. That's all that's different between him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Same culture, same teaching, same country, same kings, same situation as everybody else. But these men stood when everyone else fell. You know why? It's a matter of the heart. It was a matter of true conviction and courage and character. It was a matter of knowing the truth and not leaving it. I think this chapter testifies to a great upbringing, whether it was their parents or grandparents. Somebody had taught these boys the truth and the fact that the truth cannot be compromised. We'll deal with that more in just a few moments in one of the other, some of the other material here. But you can't compromise on truth. So, so the food's brought there and they say, we're not going to eat it. Daniel asked the captain of the guard, can you not give us something else to eat? Well, the king's going to look at you. You're going to get skinny. You're going to get sick. And I'm going to get dead if you persist in this. He says, well, give us 10 days then. Let us eat some pulse, vegetables, drink water. Come back and look at us. Don't be offended here. But when he came back in 10 days, they were fat and sassy, as we might say in our day. They were fatter and fairer to look upon. They were healthy. God's blessing them. So they're allowed to go ahead and eat that the rest of the time. They never do eat the rest of the food. Did everyone else say Peer pressure is not new. You understand that we're always outnumbered. God's people, with the exception of in the Garden of Eden at the very beginning and on the ark right there at the flood, we have never, ever, ever been in the majority. There's always more people in every town and in every village and in every city and every country of all time. There's always more people doing what is wrong than what is right. Always has been. Always will be. Get that through your skull. You are never going to be as a child of God, one who just walks through life with no difficulty and folks just pat you on the back and, oh, you're so wonderful. We appreciate so much you telling us the truth all the time. You trying to hold the line on moral matters. You not compromising the truth. Oh, we just love you for that. Now, there'll be some that will respect you for that, but there'll be a whole lot more. Remember when they crucified Jesus? When they voted? We're going to deal with that topic on Tuesday night, I believe. But don't, don't think for a minute that somehow you're going to get through this life and not have some difficulties. You're going to have some difficulties. Now, the other side is, with those difficulties also come great blessings. They're faithful to God. God blesses them. At the end of the time, Nebuchadnezzar comes up and he gives them their final exams. He begins to give these guys their tests. He talks to them. And these four young men are ten times wiser than all the wise men of the land. God has blessed them. You see the short answer here, the short lesson? Trials will come. How we react to trials will define our character. And God always blesses the faithful. Do you get that? Every time. And at some time we wring our hands. Even Jeremiah did it. Job did it. Why do the wicked prosper? They're not prospering. They're just going to die fatter. That's all. They're going to go to hell having had more stuff. I want to ask you a question. Whenever a uh, Kennedy, Edward Kennedy died about a year or so ago now. Did it really matter at the point of death that he ate more shrimp and more caviar and lived in a fancier house than most of those who had gone before? When he crossed to the other side, 
to join the man in torment there in Luke 16, did it make a bit of difference how much Maine lobster he ate in this world? Do you rather eat lobster here or beans? And go to heaven versus go to hell. See, we get all confused sometimes. I got one of my elders. And elders tend to do this sometimes. They're wise men. He says, you know, Michael, five minutes after I have eaten my belly full of beans, my stomach can't tell the difference in beans and shrimp or lobster. Isn't that true? Once you're full, you're full. It has a matter to do with priorities. Read the book of Proverbs sometime. But the point is here, God blesses them so they're elevated. They get great position because of their faithfulness. If you are, I'll tell you what will happen. I do believe this. If you live the Christian life, and we'll talk about this more in a different sermon this week too, you're honest, you're a person of integrity, your word is good, you work hard when you're at the job, whatever your hand finds to do, you do with all your might. For the most part, that is exactly the kind of employee and citizen that people respect and will elevate. What did David say? In all his years, he said, I have scarcely seen the children of the faithful begging bread. You work hard, you, you live right, you stand for what's right, and there typically will be, 1 John 10 and verse 10, Christ said, I came to bring you the abundant life. There typically will be blessing, even of a physical sort, in this world. We get so, feel so sorry for ourselves sometimes, don't we? About what we don't have. We're going to talk about that in a sermon later on. We kind of overlook the things that we do. Next chapter, chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar has a great dream. There's a great irony in this. Every now and then, blessings that we have in life can become a curse. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. <coughs> in this dream... It, well, he has a dream and it bothers him. You ever have a dream and you wake up? My wife before, I promise, she's been mad at me before. She'll wake up and be mad at me about something she dreamed in her dream that I did. You ever had that happen? Yeah. I mean, I get enough trouble, trouble when we're both wide awake. But she'll wake up, but if you did something, oh, okay, well, I wouldn't do that or whatever, you know. But you, you, we've all had a, a dream before where you had the dream and you woke up and the emotion of the dream was still there. But the details have faded. You ever had that happen? I've had that. You ever wake up, you know, and maybe somebody was chasing you, or you're, you know, something bad, your heart rate just really up, and you're, you know, but you can't remember the details? Well, that's what happens here. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Now, it's a vision God gave him, but when he wakes up, the dream is gone. So it, it disturbed him, it woke him up, it confused him, but he can't remember it exactly. So he calls his wise men. These men who are supposed to have all these gifts of, of astrology and the, these magi, these magicians, these, these wise soothsayers. He calls them in and says, hey guys, I had a dream last night. Uh, I need you to, to interpret the dream for me. And they said, well, no problem, king. Give us the dream. We'll give you the interpretation. But boys, there's the sticking point. I don't remember the dream. So tell me the dream and the interpretation. Well, now, King, if you'll tell us the dream, then we can interpret it. Now, watch this for a second. Here's where his common sense shines brightly. He says, you're just trying to buy time. If you can't tell me the dream, how can I trust your interpretation anyway? Kind of like several years ago, they had old Madame Cleo, you know, on TV. You know, the, 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 uh, the uh, palm reader, whatever she was, the voodoo woman out of Louisiana. You could call Madame Cleo, you know, she'd, she'd tell you your future. Now, in the days before caller ID, you could, now, I don't, don't call those people, but you could call them up and say, well, what is your name? You ought to be like, well, you tell me, right? I mean, you're supposed to be the one that has the key to the future. Never have understood that. If you could tell the future, you wouldn't be in Louisiana in a you know, trailer house somewhere trying to con folks. You'd be at Vegas picking that roulette wheel every spin, wouldn't you? Sure you would. They don't have a clue what they're doing. And pe but the trouble is, there's a lot of folks out there dumber than them that won't even ask these kind of questions. So he says, you tell me the dream and then I'll trust your interpretation. Well, they can't do it. So he, then he makes another logical conclusion. Why am I feeding you guys for? You, you're air thieves. You got no business being here. If you can't do what I'm paying you to do, I'm going to kill all of you. Back to my point about sometimes a blessing being a curse. Who are the wisest four people in the land? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The decree goes through. Kill all the wise men. Who's that include? Those same people. You ever got a big promotion at work, man? You wanted it so bad, and you worked hard, and you, you finally got it. Yes! Your division supervisor. Woo-hoo-hoo! -hoo. And they give you that pager back in the old days. They give you your new cell phone, and it rings all day long. And the big boss now, who didn't know you existed six months ago, now you're the man. 
Anything goes wrong in that division, he's calling you. How come production's down? How come this isn't working? Why isn't that going? And sometimes that great blessing of a promotion becomes a shackle, doesn't it? Same thing here. So, so Daniel tries to slow Ariok down. Listen, why, why the rush? He just spent all this time getting us educated and now he's going to kill us. So he tells him what's going on. He says, give us to tomorrow morning. We serve a God who, who knows this kind of material, who knows these kind of things, and we'll get you the answer. They pray all night. Next day he goes before the king. He says, oh, great Nebuchadnezzar, there is a God in heaven. And by the way, the other men had rightly said, Nebuchadnezzar, this thing you ask is very peculiar. Nobody asked this. It can't be done. And here they tell the truth. Those who dwell among men do not have this kind of information. That was the truth. So when Daniel shows up, he says, we serve a God who does. Nebuchadnezzar, here's what you dreamed. You saw a great image. It had a head of gold. It had a chest and upper arms of uh, silver. It had a belly and thighs of brass. <coughs> it had legs of iron that mingled with clay in the feet. Now he's impressed. Whoa. Something's going on, isn't it? Because, you know, as, as you know, he began to talk about it, it the, the memory comes back. That, that's exactly it. Yes, Daniel, that's what I dreamed. He's amazed. And then Daniel gives the interpretation. What he saw there was a, was a symbol or a representation of four great world empires. The first one, the head of gold, being Babylon. The second one, the, the, the one of silver, was that of the Medes and the Persians. The third one was that of the Greeks, and the fourth one that of the Romans. And that's all laid out, really, in Daniel chapter 7 through 12. You get lots of detail. You get so much detail there, you can even calculate which king's daughters married which king's daughters. You can, you can track later the, the falling out of the Grecian Empire. Uh, you take a Western Civ class, a, a freshman level Western Civ class in a college. I eventually still got my book from Texas State. SWT back when I went. But when you go through there, you can lay it down chapter by chapter. The, the events unrolling in the Middle East and the ancient Near East with the book of Daniel. It's, it's, it's eerie. It's almost as if it's inspired. Wink, wink, right? Of course God told the truth about what was going to happen. Now, the, the key point I want to draw from that image is in that interpretation. First of all, all of us, if I ask you what's the greatest world empire that ever lived, I know what you're going to say. What are you going to say? Rome, right? You know why you, is that right? Shake your head, that's the one you think is the greatest. Well, uh, uh, come on now, you lying or you just sleepy? Yes. You know why you think that? Because we are a Romo Grecan society, a Romo, uh, Roman and Greece combination, a Romo Greco, get around a minute, Greco Roman society. There you go. Our culture is based primarily on Greek and Roman philosophies, ideas, and government. That's kind of more or less how we are governed. Therefore, as we look to our ancient heritage, we think very highly of that heritage, right? That's true. Rome was great, but here's the difference in Rome and in Babylon. Babylon was the greatest, the Bible says. And here's the sense in which it was. Babylon was at peace. Nebuchadnezzar did not have to war to maintain what he had. It's kind of like Solomon, who was the greatest king of the Jews. Well, Saul and David were the conquering hero types. But Solomon is the one that sat in peace at the zenith of the Jewish empire. He's the greatest king because of the peaceful situation. Rome, for 762 years that it dominated the Mediterranean and the, and the known world at the time, only six months out of 762 years did they ever close the doors of the temple of Janus. Janus was the god of fury and courage and valor. They would open the, that temple doors up so all that stuff could be released to go out and support the troops. When they were fighting, Rome was great, but Rome had to fight and scrap to hold every inch of ground they had. There's the difference in Rome and Babylon. But it goes to this succession of nations. Babylon followed by the Persians. I'll just sum this up. The Medo-Persian Empire, later is represented by a, a ram, has two horns, one slightly bigger than the other. The Persians were just a little bit stronger than the Medes, but they would join. We've all heard of Ahasuerus or Artaxerxes there in the book of Esther. Uh, you know, the, as they conquered everything in that part of the world, <clears throat> they're followed by that rough he goat, that mighty one horn, that source of power. Alexander the Great, the Greek, who was cut off in his youth, again quoting Daniel, and his horn broke into four smaller pieces. Ptolemy, Seleucus, Teutonius, and I always forget the fourth one, there's four of them though. The generals that divided up the known world after Alexander died. <clears throat> then came that 
strange beast, that fierce beast, that beast of iron, representing the, the military dominance of Rome. It would conquer the whole world. Now, the reason I've spent time here is the very next verse, verse 44. Daniel 2, 44. And in the days of these kings, those Roman kings, then would come another kingdom that would last forever. And it's during the days of the Roman kings that Christ came, lived, and died. The church was born, and the new kingdom was established. Daniel 2.44 is a very, very key passage when you're discussing these things with premillennial people, uh, people who believe that the kingdom is yet future. You need to look at this verse. And then you need to tie it back to Mark 9 and verse 1, which says, "With Christ there preaching, Jesus says, There be some of you here this day who shall not taste of death until you see the kingdom come and see it come with power. What's that mean? Some of you folks alive right now. If I said this, there be some of you here this day who shall not taste of death until you see Gregory Portland Wildcats win another state championship. You know what that means? That means I'm still going to be alive when they do it again. That's what all that means. That's what Christ said. You're going to be alive when this happens. A couple of years later, Peter and the Twelve arise in Acts 2 and begin to open the gates of the kingdom of God. Very succinct fulfillment of what's being said here. Much more could be said, but that's the point here. Now, what happens next is Nebuchadnezzar, as we are prone to do, you ever swing from one extreme to the other? You ever eat too much dessert and kind of put on a few? Well, now I'm going to eat no sugar for a year. Yeah, right. But you know, we go to one extreme, that, that's not a bad idea, by the way, but we go from one, instead of saying I'm going to cut back just a little bit, you know, we didn't get where we are usually in one month. We're not going to get out of it in one month. But we try that sometime, right? We kind of jump to extremes. So now Nebuchadnezzar, he's wanting to worship Daniel. Daniel says, get up, man. <coughs> I'm just a man. I'm no different than those other guys except this. I know the God who knows this stuff. Which, by the way, also parallels you and me, doesn't it? We're not necessarily smarter brethren than non-Christians. We just happen to know the one that is. We happen to have found the truth. What, what makes us right and, and correct and, and knowledge-based and wise is the Word of God. Didn't David say, Thy word have it hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee? Thy word is a light unto my way and a lamp unto my path? I don't know y'all, but I'll ask this question. Is that true of you? For, forget y'all, okay? Get your own little mirror out. Look right there in your own face. Does that, is that true of us? Do we walk in the light of the gospel? And when's the last time we even read the gospel? Think about that for a little bit. I'm talking about us individually. You, know, you can be very active in church and still not know the book too well, you know, as far as what it actually teaches. And or I can know the book a whole lot to correct you. You ever notice how easy it is to do that? I can tell you what to do all day long. You know, you need to do this, you need to do that. Isn't that easy? But when I see those same flaws in myself, a little harder to apply it like I should, didn't it? This man is very humble, though, and also he gives credit to his friends. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they help me. Don't just bless me. They were involved in this also. Chapter 3, I love this chapter a lot as well. I like Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, I'm not sure from my own personal opinion, from what I read in the book of Daniel, I, I won't be surprised at all if he's in heaven when we get there. I mean, he, he's a man, when you read chapter 4 especially, he and God... God got it worked out with him, didn't he? When he had him cast out there like a wild animal, he came to himself. I know he's a patriarch. He's, uh, he's not a Jew, but under patriarchy, he's got to put a good connection with God. But here in chapter 3, and Nebuchadnezzar does kind of, kind of like some of us, up and down. You know, good, good days. He, he's on chapter 2. He's on his knees, thankful to Daniel, praising Daniel's God. <coughs> passes the law. Anybody who curses their God be cut in pieces. Ooh, he likes God. Well, he thinks he likes God. He doesn't know enough yet, you see. Chapter 3, he builds him an idol. Roughly 90 feet by 20 feet in, in length and height. Passes the law. When we play our trumpet, every knee is going to bow before this. And if you don't bow, you're going to be cast into a fiery furnace. They play the music. They're in the city of Shiner. Every knee hits the ground except three. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. My personal opinion, I don't believe Daniel was in town that day. Because you have the very same event take place just a few years later with Darius. Isn't it the same thing? Anybody who worships any god besides Darius is going to be cast to the lion's den, and he doesn't bow. But I do know the three that didn't bow, one, one way or the other. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego did not bow before that image. And a bunch of tattletales went and told the king about it. Why do you think that was? There's always these tattletales in this, in this book. 
I'll tell you exactly why. Say, brother, listen, human nature has not changed. Their life is just like our life. If they ate onions, their breath stunk. When they got out of bed, their hair was messed up. If they had a cold, their nose ran. They're just like us. These Babylonians, later I should say especially, but even in this day, these four men have been elevated. These four slaves were elevated. Maybe I was one of the conquering sergeants in the Babylonian army that took these guys slaves. So I might have slapped them around when they were kids. Drug them back to China, threw them into the dungeons. And now they're my boss. How well is that going to sit? You ever had some little wet behind the ear, no nothing person at work that you had to teach how to tie their shoes when they got there, become a boss over you? Kind of hard to swallow, isn't it? So when they messed up, in the eyes of these people, they didn't bow. They ran and told the king. Nebuchadnezzar comes back to them. Obviously, he has some respect for them. He'd have killed them out of, out of hand. He gives them a second chance. Uh, maybe y'all didn't understand. I was serious when I said this. We're going to play this music again. When you hear the music play, you must bow before this image. I love the response. It gives me chills every time I read it. Chapter 3, verse 16. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful in answering thee on this matter. For we serve a God who is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. But whether he does or whether he doesn't, we will not bow. Now there's the man of God. There's the woman of God. We ain't going to do it. Brethren, all they can do is kill you. In which case you go right to paradise. Where's the downside in that? Think about that. You know how you're going to leave this world? In a box that the Lord tarries, right? They're going to lay you up here in a box and some preacher's going to either tell the truth or exaggerate. Possibly. <laughs> Get the life you lived. It doesn't matter. Wouldn't you rather go out on your feet like this than lay in a nursing home dying a slow, painful death? When you dream of your demise, which one suits you better? So that's where character and honor and understanding the principles of life and the brevity of life come into play. We will not bow. David Baker sitting over here, I heard him say once, I'm going to give him credit right now. They wouldn't bow, they wouldn't bend, so they wouldn't burn. You know the way that it goes? Nebuchadnezzar gets mad. Throw them in the fiery furnace. They heat it up seven times as normal heat. Tie them up. They throw them in that furnace. The men who throw them in, it's so hot, the men that throw them in, they die. Nebuchadnezzar somehow can finagle it where he can look over in there. And he's shocked. Why are men shocked by God? God tells you what he's going to do. Does it. And we're like, whoa, no, that just amazes me. How dumb are we? Roughly eight or 10,000 years of recorded history and we still act like God doesn't know what he's doing when it comes to life. He looks in there and says, didn't we throw three men tied up into that fire? Yes, sir. Behold, I see four. Walking around unhurt. And one is as the angel of the Lord. So he calls them out. They come out of the fire. Their clothing is not, doesn't smell of smoke. The hair is not... I can't, cook, I can't barbecue at all. That burning all the hair off my forearms. You ever had that problem? You know? Every time. These guys are thrown in that fire furnace. Their hair is not singed. They don't smell like smoke. Great miracles work by God. Brethren, listen, we bow before God and there the list ends. You have got to brand that into your mind. It cannot be open to discussion. It cannot even come across your mind, well, do I compromise? We have several of these issues, brethren, in our, in our culture right now. The homosexual agenda situation, is that not an idol of the wicked people of our country? And are there not those that had they the capacity, they would shut the doors and lock it up if you stood here and said that that image of worshiping at that hedonistic idol is wrong? Sure they would. And we've got Christians want to come up, well, you can't say, what do I mean you can't say this? You can't say what the Bible says? When you even find yourself thinking about not standing where God told you to stand, we are in sin and grave danger. We've got congregations where it's been years since any moral matters at all have been discussed. How do we compare to these men? I like the attitude. We don't care. They weren't disrespectful, but they wanted him to know where he landed. The king of the known world is way down here. 
Brethren, we don't worship at the altar of our president or our congressmen or our senators or those nine people wearing black coats on the Potomac River. I don't care what the Supreme Court says because I know what the Supreme Court has said. Amen? And brethren, that's the kind of attitude and character we have got to possess. We need a lot more folks like this who will stand up and not compromise. You know why the radical agenda individuals in our country, like the environmental people, like the homosexual people, like the uh, abortionist industry, you know why they've made inroads? Because they will not shut up, they will not sit down, they will not stop. But unfortunately, far too many of us have. Say nothing. Coons, I'm pretty proud of Coons right now, trying to stand up for what they're doing over there. I'm not really for cheerleaders running around showing off the bloomers to everybody. That's a different issue. Your modesty is a problem. But I sure don't like the government telling us we can't put a scripture at a ball game. Y'all you aware of that? What's going on down here? That's right here in your backyard. But it's time somebody stood up, brethren, on many of these topics and said, No, sir, we will not bow. You can't do it. We're going to preach it anyway. We're going to do it anyway. Throw us in jail, then throw us in jail. We'll write a book from jail and we'll sell that too. Get it out there too. Right? That's what Paul did, isn't it? You understand that over half what he wrote, he wrote in prison? It's a matter of attitude, see? And a set heart. And watch right. Nebuchadnezzar, of course, learns a great amount there. And again, he's, they're elevated again. They're blessed again. Chapter 4, he has another dream. Chapter 4 is a pretty good chapter to look at sometimes as far as introspection. I, I would encourage you to spend some time thinking about yourself. I don't mean in a selfish way. I mean really honestly trying to analyze what you do. On a daily basis. What's my attitude? What's my first reaction? What's my, what's my feelings? How, how do I express myself? A am I living my life the way the Bible says I should? I think it's very, very easy to put our, our, our personal situation over here somewhere else. Nebuchadnezzar has a problem. He's a little bit puffed up. He dreams about this great tree. In, in the dream, an angel appears and says, cut the tree down. And they do. And he's disturbed. This time he remembers the dream, but he calls all those magicians, by the way. Why? Who had already interpreted dreams for him? Daniel. You wonder about that? Why don't we go to sources that cannot help us? You teenagers, listen up to me. This is a scary stat. 84% of 16-year-old and younger kids are much more likely to talk to a friend in the same grade about a serious moral dilemma than they are their parents. And think about that. So you're, you're a 16-year-old, confused, have no experience, know nothing about the world, and yet your brilliant concept, your brilliant ideas, I know what I'll do. I'll ask Susie Q over here, who's more worried about her lip gloss and her pimple cream than anything else in the world. I'll ask her how to fix my life. That is dumb. D-U-M. Dumb. And brother, sometimes we Christians do the same way. I talked to so-and-so. I read a book. You better be reading a book right here. I'm not saying there aren't other books that can help. But sometimes we go everywhere but where we ought to go to get actual guidance. You know why I think we fear going? I think we fear it sometimes. Because I think deep down, especially just in the church, at our stage, most of us, we already know what we ought to do. I think it's sometimes scary and intimidating to go in there and have God tell you again, son, stop what you're doing. You think about that when it comes to the Bible and therapy. There ain't no therapy in the Bible. If you're doing what's wrong, what's God's answer? Stop. Repent of what you've done. It's wrong. Quit doing it. Don't lay around on the couch for 10 years and cry. Oh, uh. Listen, life happens to us all. We could go around this room right now and everything from murdered parents to rape childhoods to theft to burglary to done wrong to being cussed out, slapped out made fun of, ridiculed. Everybody in this room has dealt with something. We all have our cross to bear. All of us. You know what those things are when you stack them up? They're excuses. You read the Bible. You know, you read the Old Testament. I want to get very pointed for a second. Every time these countries were invaded, most of the men were killed. Almost all the women were raped and then subjugated to brutal wife or slave status. Every time. And you read these battles where this one conquered and that one conquered back and this one conquered. It was a brutal, rough, horrific time in which to live and God's people still served Him faithfully. It doesn't matter what happens to us. 
It matters how we res respond to what happens to us. Now, we know that God helps and protects and keeps us out of other situations, but oftentimes those things that happen to us help us. Some of y'all might know Tommy Moore, a good friend of mine. I met Tommy 26, 27 years ago. Uh, he preached up here at Port Lavaca for quite a while, one time. Tommy's little boy, Seth. When I met him, he had a boy who was two years old. He went to school with you, didn't he? Seth got cancer. That is not fair. A two-year-old baby getting cancer. From our perspective, that makes no sense, does it? And he had it bad. I mean, he had all the surgeries. His poor arm got so big, they had to put a sling. And he died. At six years of age, he died. Four years from two until six. A horrific Debilitated, and they were stuck in Delaware. He was preaching up north. Insurance no good back down here. Died by themselves. His son died in Delaware. Him and his wife having to face that by themselves. But I've heard Tommy speak before and say, you know, I wouldn't wish that on anybody ever. But it has put me in a situation where he has been able to counsel hundreds of parents with children with terminal diseases. And my point is, what happens to us does not define us. It shows how we got where we are. But God can lead us over whatever trials that we face to great acts of service in His kingdom. Don't be overly... And I'm not trying to be callous. I, in, the, in the moment, yes. It's not wrong to cry. It's not wrong to feel bad. And we need to throw our arms around each other and try to help and support. But there needs to be a getting up off the couch. There needs to be a re-engaging in life. When David's little boy died because of his own sin, we're going to talk about that here in a few minutes. He got up, cut his hair, and ate. And went to the house of the Lord to praise him, didn't he? Remember Job? He worshipped. Now, I've faced that death before, so some of y'all probably in your own families. When you sit on those pews, the songs we sing, listen, they're not very, they're sad songs, aren't they? When you're dealing with that kind of situation. But you've got to get past it. And so Nebuchadnezzar here has a problem. His problem is arrogance. And Daniel tells him, if you don't change... God's going to remove your kingdom. A year later, by the way, when he first had the interpretation, here's another thing you see. By this stage, they're both old men. Daniel likes Nebuchadnezzar. They're good friends. And for a while, he won't tell him. And Nebuchadnezzar says, tell me the, the interpretation. And Daniel says, well, for an hour, he says nothing. He says, Daniel, tell me the dream. Daniel says, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, I wish that the interpretation of this dream was on your enemies and not you. Daniel, tell me the dream. You ever had that conversation? Are you telling me I'm not a Christian? Are you telling me my mama's lost? Are you telling me my grandma was wrong? We've all been there. We've all been at that moment. There comes a time in those discussions, brethren, when they simply need to hear the truth. And Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar, thou art the tree. Your kingdom is great. It's so tall that it encompasses the whole world, the width of it. All the animals eat the fruit of it. You are great, but you know you're great. Please repent of the arrogance of your heart that these things not happen to you because otherwise God's going to take it away. He's going to give it back, but he's going to take it away. Teach you a lesson. A year later, 12 months later, he's walking on those walls and it was a glorious uh, city. Y'all have probably all seen the Lord of the Rings and things like that. You get representations of some of these, maybe a little over the top of there, but these big cities, 185 feet towers. Walls where you could run five and six chariots abreast, you know, in, in chariot races around the walls. These were phenomenal cities. Took thousands of years to build sometimes. He walks around and says, Behold, my Babylon, which I have built with my hands to my glory. And while the words, while the words were still on his lips, God said, Cut the tree down. Struck him with some kind of disorder. Don't know what it was exactly. He goes out in the pasture, starts eating grass like an animal, lives out in the woods. But after the time had come and gone, seven times had passed over him. We're told there, then Nebuchadnezzar knew, and he confessed, there is a God in heaven who gives the kingdoms of men to whomsoever he sees fit. That's not a bad thought to have in our mind either, by the way, as November 12th comes around, brethren. There is a purpose for everything, even if we can't always see it. And our job is to humbly serve our God knowing full well that this life is but a vapor and is a proving ground for our souls. Don't get overly caught up sometime in what we're doing here. I mentioned Babylon. Have any of you ever been to Babylon and walked on those great walls and seen those glories hanging? No, you haven't. You know why? They're not there anymore. Piles of rock. That which meant so much is nothing. Thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, we'll be happy to talk to you in the back.